Welcome to another episode of Science to Make Casual. Uh, my name is Trumbum or Kevin uh, from the Cook and Bar Lab um, at BC Cancer. And this is just sort of a casual interview series where we kind of delve into the lives and uh, careers of um, successful scientists around BC. Um, so the one-on-one -on -one interview um, with Manny and I consists of um, 40 minutes and around 20 to 15 minutes are allocated to questions from the audience. So if you have any questions for Manny, uh, feel free to type it in the chat uh, over the course of the interview. Um, you can message me privately if you sort of want it a little bit um, confidential or you could just um, unmute yourself afterwards. Um, and you can just ask him whatever you want. It's very casual. Um, so without further ado, um, today's guest is actually the person that kind of inspired me to make these series. Uh, I went through a few scientists, um, you know, based off of their interests, but, you know, hearing Manny's story, um, you know, getting to his career, I was like, wow, I wonder if other people have gone, you know, had the same experiences and, um, the more I talk with different scientists around BC, they've had very, very interesting, uh, you know, journeys to get to where they are today. And I think that's such an interesting sort of thing, to, you know, thing to learn about. Um, and, you know, even the most successful scientists are all human. They've been through things, they've made mistakes and, you know, they've had doubts, ups and downs. So um, Manny was actually my previous supervisor at Memorial University. Uh, he supervised my undergraduate research, and now he's the Shrum Chair uh, in Biological Mechanisms of Disease at Simon Fraser University. Um, <clears throat> and Mandy was sort of the one who kind of, well, he was the main person who ignited, ignited my sort of pursuit for research, and he kind of confirmed my, you know, love for it. So Manny, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> I mentioned this, um, you know, just now, but, you know, when I visited Simon Fraser and we sort of just had our conversations, um, you know, you were always such a, you know, uh, not a, a, you know, astute supervisor. You always knew what you were doing. You're always confident, but, you know, you told me about your sort of journey, uh, across your PhD, um, also through your undergrad. Um, and it actually surprised me how many sort of you know, how much of a uphill battle, a downhill battle, like um, how many ups and downs you've had and how many um, uncertainties there were um, until an opportunity came up for you to sort of take. Um, I was wondering if you just go through that journey of, you know, you starting before, even before graduate school, you, you know, being sort of what you wanted to do at the end of your undergraduate and how you enter graduate school and, how you actually got through that, you know, you know, those lows when you sort of initially had no idea what was, <laughs> you know, what you were doing and things like that. Sure. Um, well, thanks for having me, Kevin, or John. Of course. Thanks for, uh, thanks for your uh, kind words. You know, I'm honored <laughs> to hear that uh, somehow I could play a role in somebody's uh, interest and motivation. And so that's of course. Really, really great. Yeah. Well, uh, I came to Canada when I was 15 years old from Iran, mm -hmm. and um, so I uh, fast-tracked through high school. I came, my parents settled in Toronto, that's where I'm now visiting them. So I fast-tracked through high school uh, in a couple of years. Uh, so I came in grade nine, but I took, I had to take some tests. And so, so basically, I was sort of like 16 years old when I graduated high school here, and I started my undergrad. Oh. So that... Uh, you know, was challenging because I didn't think at the time it was challenging. I was, I thought it was great. I'm ahead, you know, it's good. I'm starting early, but um, in retrospect, you know, I wasn't ready. I was just a young kid in a new country after a year of immigration, still like finding myself and then starting undergrad and going to U of T where there's like thousands of students in a class. Yeah. And so I, I went through four years of undergrad like that. And my first couple of years, I really struggled. Actually, I got bad grades i was maybe was failing some courses i was like getting 50s 60s i was barely passing a lot of courses and some other courses like math i was doing better yeah uh, so i i didn't really have an interest in book studying i still don't really have an interest in book reading 
my students, you probably know that you guys are like, you know, bringing me an article and I kind of look at it quickly. And I'm not a, you know, I just tend to try to get a bigger picture of something. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I struggled. Uh, I didn't really know how to study, how to just be a university student. I was basically a kid. Um, yeah. And the newly immigrated kid to Canada. And so with all the adjustment that goes with that. Uh, but I had it in my mind uh, and, you know, this is a typical like uh, thing from my culture and a lot of other cultures that your parents want you to go to medical school or your family. Of course, school. of course. And in my case, I actually didn't have any pressure from my family. It was just ingrained in me from uh, back home that like if you're a top student, you end up in medical school. So yeah. I did life sciences and <clears throat> um, eventually ended up in immunology and microbiology. And in my third and fourth year of undergrad, I kind of understood what's up and I tried to pull up my grades a little bit and so I was getting more 70s 80s some 90s but by then it was kind of late and I couldn't really undo the damage that I had done my first couple of years so my average was like nowhere near good enough to even be considered for medical school so the only alternative was grad school so I had done my honors in a in a lab and I was lucky enough after my third year to do a summer job in TACMAX lab so TACMAC is arguably one of the biggest scientists in immunology in the world. He's the mm -hmm. one who discovered T-cell receptor for people that don't know, and uh, or co-discovered the T-cell receptor with Mark Davis and was the first person to start making knockout mice in immunology. So he knocked out CD4, CD8, everything we know about CD4 T-cells and CD8 T-cells and all that comes from, much of it comes from his work and T-cell selection and all that, amongst uh, many other cancer and stuff. So at that time, I went to his lab as a third year student, and they had just made CD4 and CD8 knockout cells or mice. Wow. And I was like a summer student. And so that kind of was an early interest. That was just one summer. And then I uh, ended up doing my honors in another immunology lab. That, uh, and throughout all that, I found that I still had no, not a lot of interest in reading and all that, but book reading and book learning. I was never really a good book learner. But somehow I could figure things out in the lab and I could, I loved the lab work aspect. And um, so I applied to graduate school and I ended up um, uh, going for some different labs, rotating. Uh, and I eventually end up, ended up in the lab of my PhD supervisor, Jill Wu, uh, who Jill, um, she is a fantastic scientist. She's, um, her lab worked on B cells and VDJ recombination. So mm -hmm. how B cells generate antibody receptors and the genetic yeah. events of that for people that are not immunologists, because B cells have to assemble certain genes to be able to make antibodies and they have to do chromosomal breaks. And it's, it's something that's very unique. That's called VDJ recombination. It's done by RAG proteins, which I'll get back to again later. So I started working in Jill's lab, had a pretty good successful first couple of years. And remember, by this time, I'm pretty much a 20-year-old kid, right? 20, yeah. 21-year-old kid. Did pretty well in her lab. And I kind of lost track of um, lost track of my way in my second year after, I would say, my comp exams. I started and just all of a sudden, being in grad school afforded me more freedom with my time. So I could mm -hmm. come to the lab at certain hours and do my work. But I started sort of discovering that I can have a personal life outside the lab. And... Uh, you know, I probably took that to, not probably, I, I took that to an extreme. So I started like um, just really enjoying my life, trying different things like, um, you know, just socializing and just different aspects of personal life to the point where it kind of was interfering with my lab work a little bit. Yeah. So, so I had some early success in grad school, published a couple of papers in my first couple of years. Uh, passed my comp exams and everyone knows who's a senior PhD student that there's always a little lull after your comp exams you know you yeah. you start out you get some momentum after your comp exams it's very very common to have a year or two where you're trying to really find yourself like what is my project what am I going to do to finish my PhD like yeah. how am I going to contribute to the field and this combined with like the fact that I newly found my freedom and you know bought, bought myself a little car so I was going around and socializing and everything like that Got, a, got myself a motorcycle, so I was doing that. Started, you know, having other interests outside the lab. So I kind of just lost my way, and I started becoming a very bad grad student, like what I was, somebody that I would, as a supervisor, really struggle with. Um, yeah. I wasn't really producing very well. Like, I was just not really showing up to work. I just lost my interest in a way, and I lost my my way in, in science a little bit. So I kind of struggled with my motivation, my interests, uh, and I just kind of discovered 
there is more to life. And again, typical of a, a kid that sort of, uh, I never really did stuff as a teenager because I immigrated to Canada. Yeah. I went through high school very fast. Basically, um, the best way to put it is maybe a 22 year old acting like a 15 year old, really mm -hmm. like just doing teenage stuff, you know, just because of that part of my life was late coming. So, so I started getting into some trouble with my supervisory committee, like not getting satisfactory reports. And my supervisor started like having a few serious talks with me and this all made me more belligerent. And I was like, you know, what, uh, what are you guys talking about? I'm doing fine. I published a couple of papers. So it came to a point where, um, you know, the committee basically decided grad school isn't for you. And I said, well, wow. you know, you're right. It's not for me. I'm going to try doing something else. And basically I had no idea what I would do, but I just knew that, uh, okay, this is like not going well. Yeah. And so I left grad school after three years. Um, and I thought I would just start writing up my master's degree and then figure out what I wanted to do. Maybe, I don't know, go to teacher's college or go to study business. I had no idea mm -hmm. really what I was going to do. So I spent a yeah. year just being, um, uh, being unemployed. I wasn't unemployed. I was doing odd jobs. So I tried my hand at different jobs. So I would uh, earn some money by tutoring or teaching on the side. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, you need money to feed those other things that you're doing on the personal it, front. Exactly. Right. So um, I worked as a motorcycle mechanic. I started buying and fixing old motorcycles and making some money, tutoring, um, just odd jobs. Um, working with my hands a lot and things like that. And, um, and then it got kind of like tiring. And, um, and then I would say I started writing up a master's thesis, but I was not really motivated to do that either. So I just kind of left it. And then um, like a defining event in all that is I met a friend of mine who was a senior PhD student at that time, uh, Jim Carlyle, who's now a professor at U of T. He works on NK cell receptors. So he was a few years ahead of me and we were good friends and I was one of a mentor. And so we met for a coffee one time and he was like, what's going on in your life? So we started to talking and he said, he brought up this idea for me, which is um, that there was someone I had met at a conference a few years ago, uh, Margie Ottinger, who was a professor at Harvard. So Margie mm -hmm. Ottinger was the person who discovered or co-discovered the RAG enzymes. So RAG enzymes are the enzymes that do VDJ recombination in B cells. Yeah. So Margie Ottinger and David Schatz were the co-discoverers of RAG, RAG1 and RAG2 when they were working in David Baltimore's lab in the late 80s, early 90s. So there's a couple of papers, 89 and 90, that describes the discovery of RAG proteins. So Margie was a professor at Harvard. She had come to Toronto to give a talk. This is back when I was still in my second year. So I was still doing good. I was on track. I was gone. I went to her talk. We had a meeting after. I was, wanted to sit down with her one-on-one -on -one because I had questions about the RAG enzymes and things like that. And she was kind of impressed by me and we corresponded a bit. And she said, why don't you think about coming to my lab to do a postdoc after you finish your PhD? So then I just forgot about all that. And I actually, yeah. no, I, uh, and I had gone to her lab once. I asked my supervisor to send me on a trip to her lab to talk to her, to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with her. So I had gone to Boston in my second year, just a few months after that meeting to meet with her again and talk with her more. And we really kind of like planned this. I was going to go to do a postdoc with her. And then it just fell off. I yeah. didn't think about it anymore. Um, so when I met my friend Jim for a coffee, he said, oh, he just reminded me of that. I said, don't you remember there was this professor at Harvard? What about if you write her an email and see if you could go to finish your PhD in her lab? And I was like, oh, wow, that sounds like a good idea. Um, so I hadn't even thought about it. And, um, and so, uh, so I started talking to my supervisory committee and my department chair, all these people that I had alienated and I wasn't even yeah. responding to their emails. I was in all their bad books because I was like, I don't want anything to do with you. Yeah. So I started all of a sudden knocking on their doors again, like with my head down and just trying to talk to them and say, okay, listen, I know I kind of messed up, but what about this? Like, I don't think my supervisor and I will get along if I want to go back. I don't think she will take me back because I've really messed up my chance here. I haven't been a good grad student, but what if we could work out something and I could go to Margie's lab and finish my PhD? And and they were very gracious and they were supportive. And I talked to all of mm -hmm. them and eventually my committee and my supervisor, they all agreed. They said, maybe you, this could be a second chance. So we wrote her an email and we said, this is the situation. 
you know, I have potential, but I forgot who wrote an email. I wrote something and then I think the department chair and my supervisor and a bunch of people wrote oh, it wow. and said, yeah. this kid, you know, he has potential. He's done okay. He's lost his way. Do you want a rescue case, basically? And <laughs> we didn't hear back for weeks and weeks. And I was checking my email like every second. And eventually she responded and said, okay, I've gone to some colleagues and I've consulted them. And they said, all right, we'll give him one chance on a probationary basis. Send him on. So that was uh, a few months after that, uh, I packed uh, up my car and I moved uh, basically to Boston and I started this second chance in Marge's lab. And um, so I kind of ended up from uh, sort of unemployed, uh, you know, living that kind of lifestyle over, somewhat overnight to uh, Harvard. So huh. That's uh, that's the part of the story, and I could tell you a lot more about what happened to me there because um, you know what happened there to me was actually very transformational from a personal and career perspective. Because all of a sudden, I'm being given a second chance, uh, and I want to really take it and not lose it. Yeah, and I also want to prove myself to my committee and my supervisor, whom I have very much disappointed, and I want to show them I have potential. Um, and one of my committee members quit on me because he said, I can't, this kid is so not together. I don't want to be on his committee. Oh, wow. <laughs> I wanted to prove to this individual that I'm, you know, that I'm good. I can do this. Yeah. And, you know, for a long time, I was resentful of that. And now I look back at that person and I, I'm so thankful. I mean, now we're best of friends. I've invited him to give talks, you know, yeah. we meet at conferences. And these people are like now all, you know, my best friends. And I really realized that, the, that's the best thing that someone did for me was, was, was at that time, it felt like a blow, but that's how life is. You know, sometimes you look back and you say to yourself, if I didn't get a blow at that time, I wouldn't re I wouldn't change my, my ways. So anyways, yeah. uh, I ended up at Harvard. And if you want, I'll tell you more about them, you know, more about what that was like. Yeah. I mean, you told me like, once you sort of entered the lab at Harvard, you switched completely. You were always there at the lab instead of never being there. You, you know, you just sort of started getting like this love relationship for research. That was your yeah. home, essentially. Yeah. Your lab became yeah. your home. Exactly, exactly. So yeah. it was a bunch of things. It was like, basically, it's, this is my one chance, second chance at this. And, and this is like an opportunity I don't want to waste. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want to disappoint my new supervisor who took a chance on me. Um, she was very gracious, very nice. And I just, and very smart. One of the smartest people I've ever met. And I didn't want to disappoint her. The second thing is just the, the sheer proximity being in that place. You can't help but be motivated. So let me, let me paint you this picture. So I was on, yeah. on our floor at the Mass General Hospital. Uh, that's where the research institute was. Margie's lab was in the Department of Genetics, but it wasn't mm -hmm. on campus. It was at one of these research hospitals. So on our floor, there was four labs. There was Margie's lab. There was Bob Kingston or Robert Kingston, who's, who used, whose lab worked on chromatin. So his lab did some of the first work on chromatin remodeling like switch yeah. sniff complexes, how they come and open chromatin. Oh, wow. Then there was Jack Shawstack, who has won the Nobel Prize in 2020 who, for the discovery of telomeres and telomerases. And, but he had moved on. The telomeres yeah. were just a small thing he did. So he had moved on and he was working on RNA world. So he was trying to reconstitute cells from the primordial soup of how you know, membranes formed and the first cell formed. So there was his lab. And then there was Fred Ozebel, who's a plant immunologist, who's really done some pioneering work on like um, plant immune system. Mm -hmm. uh, and then downstairs from us was this other lab, Brian Seed, and then Jen Sheen, who's like a crystallographer and a C. elegans guy. And all these people were labs that were publishing in nature and science like on a monthly basis. So these yeah. labs were top labs. So, so they were all at the front frontier part of their their lab and so i walked in there and these labs are big and they have like 10 postdocs and 20 grad students and i saw how they work i mean these guys worked around the clock they didn't go home they yeah. worked like and the postdocs from all over the world like brazil argentina japan mm -hmm. korea germany you name it u.s and i saw i just for the first time i saw okay this is how people work in such a top environment like everybody works everybody comes early in the morning everybody works late everybody works every weekend everybody works every night but then we had a lot of fun we would go out to the pub or we would go out for lunches and we would gather in yeah. these lunch rooms and it was 
never like mundane conversations about like how is your life or it was always about science it was always about someone drawing on a blackboard like no this is how i think it works and another person running and, and challenging them and it was like but so and so just published this other paper and it was it was just a top environment like it was science you know for what it should yeah, be yeah. it wasn't you know people relaxing gathering outside the lab talking about uh sports or how their weekend was or it wasn't none of that it was it was just science it was like really a professional environment and i just loved yeah. it i just really loved it and not to say that again you know it was a work hard play hard mentality right and then it was so that was the second thing and my eyes opened and i thought oh okay so this is how you work if you want to publish nature and science like this is how you have to work and this is how you have to think and this is a commitment like this is not 99%. This is 120%. Like, yeah. This is, and then the other thing is I, I just got interested in my project. So I started purifying these RAG enzymes, which are really complex enzymes that have to do these, like cut the DNA in a cell and rearrange genes and stuff like that. And, you know, my project was to work with purified enzymes. So I would express them in cells and I would go and purify them in a test tube. And then I would test them on like purified DNA. So I got very much drawn to that i got very mm -hmm. much fascinated by how you could take a complex enzyme that works in the whole cell with all the machinery and after millions of years of evolution purify like express it in bacteria purify that where there's nothing else around but buffer and dna put it in a test tube and it will still work and it will yeah. still like it will cut the dna exactly at the right sequence and i was i just found that so magical and i i remember running to margie's office with my first gel which had two bands on it, like the substrate and the product and showing yeah. her like I have activity. And she said to me, okay. So she said to me, this is when you get addicted to enzyme biochemistry. And I was yeah. like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But <laughs> now I look back, I don't know, 20 years later and I'm doing enzyme biochemistry and it's true. It's actually true. That moment I became completely addicted to enzyme biochemistry. And I've done that ever since my career. Because I still find it like whenever, you know, in my lab we work with other enzymes that mutate. Yeah, yeah. And whenever we take a new enzyme that I haven't, you know, we haven't ever expressed and purified before, and you know this because you've been in my lab, and yeah, we, of course. we do it for the first time and we find that it works, like it actually has activity and does something to DNA, I still have the same feeling. My heart still jumps out of my chest and I say, wow, that's amazing. Like I could take this, this machinery out of a cell, put it in E. coli, do a whole bunch of things to it, take it out, you know, do spend four days doing other things to it, then put it in a test tube. It's never experienced any of this stuff, by the way, throughout millions of years of evolution. And then it yeah, does yeah. exactly what I wanted to do. And, and I, I just find that that's still magical for me. And uh, so anyways, so all this stuff happened. And, uh, you know, all this was sort of why I kind of kicked it into a, you know, it just, I was lucky to get this opportunity. Um, I started, you know, uh, getting some results, writing back to my supervisor and my committee back in Toronto with PowerPoints for the first oh. time showing data. Wow. Uh, like, look, this is what I've done. I've purified these enzymes. These are my projects. I'm going to work on this. I'm going to work on this. Margie wow. and I have met to talk about these projects. And, and then they went, oh, who is this person? And they started replying <laughs> with interested emails like, great, you know, we're do this. Maybe you, sh you should try that. And then, and then I started saying, okay, so, you know, that the way where they used to write me emails and I would ignore them, that's wrong. You know, now when they write me emails, I'm going to respond in a minute because yeah. I appreciate this opportunity, right? So, yeah, I think all in all, you know, that was a life-changing experience for me. Also, also, it was the only time, the first time I moved away from home. So it was part of yeah. growing up too and living on your own. And uh, so it just all came together and uh, made a bunch of friends I'm still in touch with. Um, and I just think that was like the best, uh, you know, scientific years, really life-changing um, in wow. a period in, in my life. And uh, I always try to remember that. And, uh, you know, I think, I think those opportunities are there for everyone. And we just sometimes don't see that. But mm -hmm. for me, in my case, it was, you know, it was the second chance I was going to get one. And somehow I got lucky that I was able to use that second chance and not burn it because yeah. I would never get another one like that. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to ask, like, what was like the differences between, you know, labs at Harvard, labs here? or labs, you know, in other parts of Canada. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's staggeringly different, actually. Um, 
but you know, what made you go back to Canada for, you know, to finish your postdoc or to have a career? Um, oh yeah. Okay. Um, so I had to go back to Canada to defend my PhD because my, 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 I was still a student at the University of Toronto with like an affiliation uh, at Harvard, a visiting scientist at Harvard. So I had to go back and write my thesis. So after a couple of years, um, I went back and um, uh, said, okay, I would write my thesis back home in Toronto. And uh, part of the reason for that was that Boston was just an incredibly expensive city to live in. So mm, when I was living yeah. there, I was also very poor because I was making like $15,000 Canadian a year. Oh, geez. Uh, so I know a lot of grad students always complain that they're poor or whatever, not grad students, postdocs, people always just complain about money. But um, this is just what I have to say for that. I was making $15,000 Canadian, which at that time was 50 cents to a dollar. So it was like $7,000 US a year. And mm -hmm. Boston, you can look up the rent. It's expensive. So I was living in a room, shared room with like six other people, uh, you know, not eating a lot of food, but eating like whatever, bread and stuff like that. Yeah. So I was sort of like, okay, you know, it might be time to, if I'm just going to write, I'm going to go back to Toronto and live a more comfortable life. So that said, I say that that year was the best time of my life. I was the yeah. poorest I've ever been, but life quality and happiness has nothing to do with how much money you make. It has to do all with what's going on in your head and your motivation and how you feel about yourself. And for the first time, I felt like I am performing to my potential. Like I'm you know, clicking on all cylinders and proving myself. And that was amazing for me. So anyways, mm -hmm. I went back to Toronto, wrote my PhD thesis, defended it, which is funny. That was during the summer of SARS in 2003. Oh, so yeah. The last coronavirus. So we were still able to have on campus face-to-face -face thing. But I remember after my PhD defense, the chair of my defense said, I have to apologize to you because we're not allowed to shake hands. And we, I thought at that time, that's so drastic. You know, obviously after Corona, <laughs> that seems like a nothing. But yeah, yeah. he said, I can't shake hands with you, but why don't you walk to School of Graduate Studies with me and, you know, I have to file your paperwork and we can chat along the way. And I thought that was so nice. So I walked with him and we had a chat. And then I defended. And then I went back to Jill's lab now as a, to do a one-year postdoc to kind of mm -hmm. uh, finish up a couple of papers. So yeah. one was a collaborative paper with Margie. Another one was a paper that I had been working on. So I spent a year there um, introducing some of the technology that I had learned in Margie's lab to Jill's lab and showing some different labs in Toronto how to purify rag proteins and stuff like that. And got a couple of uh, papers. So I was able to finish my PhD on a high note and come full circle with my supervisor. And I went from basically a, the worst student she ever had, uh, which I was, to somebody who could come back and bring something new to her lab and contribute, which was extremely gratifying. And now we are just the best of friends. She's still my biggest supporter, my mentor. Um, she writes me letters of reference whenever I need it. And in fact, for my Trump chair, I asked her for a letter of reference. Oh, wow. So, That's incredible. And uh, yeah, we, we get together a couple of times a year and, and it's amazing. It's really good to, you know, there's nothing better than repairing relationships that were broken and mostly because of my fault right yeah. so anyways uh, so after that i didn't again know what i wanted to do so uh, that was 2003 i'd finished up that mini postdoc defended my phd and then i got an email from a new faculty at the university of toronto uh, alberto martin who had just come back from a postdoc in new york mm -hmm. uh, and established his lab at the university of toronto and alberto was working on AID, which he had uh, just published a Nature paper in Maddie Sharp's lab. AID is another enzyme that's involved in antibody diversification, but it's uh, not like the RAGs. It uh, causes mutations. So for, again, people that are not immunologists. So it's another DNA altering enzyme. So that's the common trick. And uh, he had just published a paper where what he had done is put AID in, in fibroblasts, or I think it was B cells. Another group had done it in fibroblasts and showed that AID was sufficient in hybridoma B cells to mediate somatic hypermutation. So that was the paper that showed that AID might by itself be attacking DNA and causing mutations. So then what he wanted to do was establish a system in his lab to purify AID. And he knew that AID was a difficult protein, just like the rats. So the common thread with these enzymes is that they're extremely difficult to work with because they cause damage to the DNA. 
when you put them in a cell to express them, uh, the cell is not happy. So it's not diff it's different than expressing like a membrane protein or whatever. So again, for people that are not immunologists or protein biochemists. So it's another difficult protein. Many labs were trying to do the same thing uh, because AID also causes cancer. So it was a really hard protein to work on at that time in the early 2004, 2005, which was AID was discovered in 2000, 99, 2000 by Tesuko Hanjo, who is the Nobel Prize winner of 2000. And 19, if I'm not mistaken, for his work on immunotherapy. Yeah, PD1. Uh, like, PD1, yeah. 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 So, so anyways, he wrote me an email. He said, oh, I heard you're back in Toronto. I heard you know how to purify difficult enzymes because you've done rags. Mm -hmm. And do you want to try AID and do a postdoc in my lab? So I said, okay, this sounds good. It kind of goes against the wisdom of how you want to do a postdoc because everyone said you should go to a big lab like everyone wants to go to a bigger, more established lab, like a big name or at a big institution to do a postdoc. That's the, the established wisdom in academia, right? You, you do your PhD at the University of Toronto, but then you may want to go to, you may want to go to Harvard or you may want to go to Yale. But yeah. I felt like in my case, I've already been to a bigger university and, you know, Canada is, seems okay to stay at right now. And, and I thought this would be a gamble because this is kind of going against some established rules. Like, you're not, you know, you're, people say you should go to an established lab, but Alberto was new. But what I liked about him was that he was hungry. He yeah. wanted to publish papers and he, he was very, very hungry to get going in his lab. And I thought, you know, being the first postdoc, I get to establish the lab and, and learn that and also get my pick of the projects, right? And so I said, yes, and I started that. And then, so that ended up being a, a postdoc that uh, took me three or four years to establish an AID expression system. But in the meantime, I worked on other projects and I was able to publish like five or six first author papers. Uh, and it was a great environment because I learned how to establish a lab from Alberto right from get-go. Uh, he was very, very keen. And I remember he would come to the lab at, at four in the morning. And if, if I showed up at eight, he would ask me, he's like, why are you so late? And I had to remind <laughs> him, like, eight o'clock is, yeah, but I've been here since four. And I would be like, oh, God. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, anyways, you know, it's not for everybody to work like that. You know, I'm, I certainly don't talk to my students like that yeah. uh, and ask them. But for me, it was great. I loved that motivation. I mean, I just, we got along. And I, again, he was super, he was a super motivator because he was gung-ho. He wanted to get going. He wanted to establish himself. And we were publishing papers. And, and every time we would go to his office with an interesting result, he'd be like, yeah, yeah, let's write this paper. And let's do it. And okay, do this with them and, and get a paper. And so, yeah, that was a good postdoc at uh, five years. And I think we managed to publish like a dozen papers uh, by the end of that, including the first papers that described the uh, biochemical characterization of AID. And I got a couple of fellowships, which were motivating, like my first fellowship as a postdoc. So when I started the postdoc, I didn't know if this was academia was for me. But when I started publishing and when I got the fellowship, because of the papers I had published, and then I realized, well, maybe I can do this because, I mean, I've, I'm learning how to publish papers. I'm learning how to write grants and people like my ideas and they're funding them. Um, and I learned all that from Alberto. He taught me how to write grants. He taught me how to write papers. Um, uh, he was just a super, super smart person to work for. Always full of new ideas. Uh, always full of energy. Like you would come in the lab and it would be like, no, no, I want you to try this. And I want you to try this and get, throw 10 ideas at you. And, yeah. um, and then he also realized uh, that I was achieving some success in his lab and he supported me fully. He was giving me grad students to supervise. Uh, I had my own technician to supervise. Um, so I had sort of my own node in the lab. So he was fully supportive. Um, so it worked out. That was another thing, you know, going to a sort of a small lab and a, and a, and a, a new uh, person. And I, I always give that advice now. I say to people, like, don't necessarily think about going to a big, more established lab and being one of 20 postdocs there and competing for projects. You know, there's something to be said for going to work with a new person if it's the right person. And I think the personalities have to click. In yeah. our case, we really did because we, I think, operate on the same energy level and we yeah. have the same drive and we're both like i think pers personality wise we're both uh, competitive individuals and at the end of the day that's what brought us together we knew other labs were working on aid and we did not want to get beaten 
and we would argue scientifically and we would you know, want to take different directions, uh, I thought we should go with one way of working and he had other ideas, which is great and healthy. But we had one thing, the biggest thing we had in common was that we were both competitive and we wanted to achieve success. And he was you know, an amazing supervisor and I've learned so much from him. And uh, you know, I tried to model myself a lot after him in my early career. And then at the end of that, I, was, I started applying for faculty positions. I think I sent more than 100 applications because oh, wow. getting a faculty position is very competitive also. Yeah. And uh, I was lucky enough to get uh, two interviews and was offered both positions, uh, one in Western Canada and one in Memorial and uh, Newfoundland, which is where you and I met. And eventually I took the one at Memorial in 2009 and I went there and I started my own lab. Wow, interesting. And that's the advice actually you gave me. You're like, you know, don't always necessarily look for somewhere um, that has, you know, that only publishes nature papers. You, know, you would probably be better off looking for someone that's more sort of ambitious, more energetic. And that's actually how I met uh, Florian out of all people. Um, yeah, that's the advice I give everyone. I think that, uh, you know, a match between a student supervisor and a postdoc is so important that you have the same vision and you have like, you work with someone that has the same, the same expectations, the same sort of way of working, you know, uh, exactly, there's, yeah. there's, there's no doubt that there's many brilliant people in science, right? I mean, I'm, I don't consider myself in the top 99%. I think I'm in the bottom 1% when it comes to having new ideas and brilliance, like almost everyone I meet in science, I'm, I, I'm impressed. I'm like, this person is so much smarter than me. But yeah. I have a certain way of working and a certain drive. And I like to work with people that have that drive and passion. Yeah. And I think if you start off with that, then, you know, uh, it's a good recipe. And if you yeah. don't have that, and if you have a more, you know, a different sort of a way of working, that's great too. Then you can work with someone who has that more that way. And so as it's all a matter of clicking and finding an environment that suits, suits a style of thinking and style of yeah. operating. Yeah, and you know, um, I don't know if this carried on throughout your sort of experiences throughout your PhD and um, throughout your postdoc, but you have really interesting sort of ways of running a lab compared to what I've seen of other labs where you sort of study everything about an enzyme, not just, you know, it's activity, not just in use in medicine, but you study it through evolutionary time. Um, and, you know, a lot of people here, a lot of people um, that are in medicine or, you know, just in simple that study enzymatics, they always try to stick to mammalian models or they always try to stick to something relevant yeah. to humans um, to yeah. try to make themselves relevant to either translational science or just um, molecular biology. But um, how have your approaches to studying sort yeah. of it's enzymes across time? That. Yeah, because we just published a paper in Frontiers in Immunology uh, that talks about that, talks about how, how people do not pay attention enough to other species and other models and how yeah. it uses our own work as an example to show that studying those evolutionary relationships can actually have benefits for health research. Some of the biggest things that we've done in my lab, uh, including uh, the design of some cancer uh, inhibitor drugs that we're working on right now has been made possible because we decided to take a different way and study uh, enzymes in fish or other species. So the way it came about for me was basically exactly the reason that you said. So I always try to think differently than everybody else in the crowd. I think in science, the best thing you could do is try to think differently than everybody else. It's not about one way is right or another way is wrong. Thinking against the paradigm is always right. To me, Thinking against working in a way that's different from others is always the right way to work. That's just me. So when I started my career, I saw that, you know, I was working on AID and this related apoBec enzymes, which are all enzymes that cause DNA mutations and are involved in immunity and cancer. And I saw that exactly what you said. Everybody is working on mouse and human. So I thought, okay, well, uh, people aren't really working on them from different species. And back in Alberto's lab, he and I talked one time and he had this idea that uh, we should collaborate with this other person that he had met who had cloned AID from catfish, uh, Brad Ma Major at the University of Alberta. So he said, I talked to Brad and he's going to give us the fish AID. And at that time I was like, okay, well, yeah, sure. 
it's something. I don't know. I don't get it, but we'll try it. And we started working on that one fish AID, and it was different. And it was different from other, the way that the human was. And it was active at a different temperature. And all of a sudden, this thing sparked in me that, you know, there's nobody working in this area. There's nobody working with enzymes, you know, cancer causing, not just enzymes, but cancer causing molecules in different species to study how they're different from human. Yeah. And so I went there for the same simple reason that I thought there is, there's more space there because the, my field was so crowded with big labs working in yeah. the human and mouse systems that I just couldn't compete with them. So the initial reason I went there wasn't necessarily of scientific interest. It was just thinking there's more elbow room here. You know, maybe I could do something that other people aren't doing. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the first way it started for me, because I think typically when people start their lab, they, they do the opposite. They think at yeah. what the big shots, the big labs are doing, and they want to do that. Yeah. And they think, oh, that's what I should do. So they end up taking a little piece of what everybody else is doing. And in my case, I, I just, my brain works differently. So I thought, I don't want to do what they're doing. I'm going to do the opposite. They're working on mouse or human. I'm going to work on fish or I'm going to do other species. So I think it's a matter of how your brain works, you know, follow yeah. the crowd or go against the crowd. I think there are two kinds of people, not one is not better than the other. That's simply how my brain works. And so we got into it for that reason. We published a few papers. They were well received by the field. We managed to publish them in good journals. We got emails from colleagues saying, this is really cool. I got invited to give talks and we started writing grants on them and they were getting funded. And so it got built up from there. And so from there, we started really building up this evolutionary aspect, uh, and then it took on its own life. And then I had some really great graduate students, fantastic, brilliant people in my lab who just took this to a whole other level and, you know, took it from working from like five or six species to like, now we're doing thousands, you know, or we're hoping to yeah. do thousands on a scale that's never been done before. So it was a, it was a combination of me being a contrarian and wanting to do something nobody else was doing and taking a chance. By the way, whenever you do that, you take a huge risk because you take yeah, the risk of people are look at this work and laugh at it. And I did get laughed at. I got some grant reviews thinking, why do you want to work on fish? Just go and crystallize the human enzyme. Yeah. And, and, and so that's fine. That's part of what, whenever you decide to go against the way that others are working, you should always prepare yourself that, you know, uh, majority of the field might not take you seriously and it might take some time to, really prove your way of thinking and that's okay uh i like that i i for me the value is in doing something different um so yeah now it's taken on its own life and we've started we started doing other stuff also that was different like i had never worked on viruses before I, uh, and then we started collaborating with mike grant's lab who was next to me who turned out to be you know my best collaborator and a fantastic mentor we started working on some of the roles of these other enzymes in the context of virology and viral infections. And we made some new discoveries there, again, that went against the dogma because people at yeah. the time thought that these enzymes are antiviral, they attack viruses. And we showed that actually the virus can use it to its own benefit. And so that was another really um, um, gratifying um, aspect of the lab. So that brought in virology, cancer research, immunology, biochemistry, evolution, and yeah, and we still have the same mix of everything. I think partially, to answer your question, it's because the enzymes that we work on are involved in all these things. They're involved in viruses, immunology, cancer. And partially, it's just my way of thinking. It's like I find it limiting when people define themselves and they say, I'm a so-and-so researcher, like I'm an immunologist or I'm a, you know, um, XXYZ researcher. I never yeah. call myself that because I think that's, like it's bad enough when people try to put you in a box and why should I put myself in a box? Like, uh, I don't want to put any label on myself. I'm just curious. And, uh, you know, if there is any area that I think, um, is under researched or any cool question, I think we should go after it. And that's what I've always told my trainees. Like, why not? You know, someone, yeah. if you can ask a question and it's intelligent and it's no one's looking there, go for it. And if someone's looking there, still go for it and just try to, work smarter and be more efficient um, and try to have multiple projects uh, so that, um, you know, if you do get scooped on your idea by other labs, because whenever you're working on like a field that has a lot of interest, that's always a reality of what we do. Um, exactly. So, you know, I think having a breadth 
always makes you more strategic too, uh, because your competitors can't guess, uh, you know, where your next play is going to come from. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. And I think being at Memorial University, I was lucky enough that I had some amazing students like yourself and sort of your peer mm -hmm. that allowed me to do that. Because if it wasn't for having the students and fundings and colleagues who are supportive of your ideas, right? Like department chairs that uh, if you need more space, they can support you and give you more lab space. Or uh, a university that, you know, you can write a small grant and say, I have a different idea. I want to work on like fish, you know? Um, so we have a, a big paper right now in the works. We hope that we found something completely different about the immune system of a fish. And the entire idea started with me, uh, uh, you know, thinking about this one fish that seems to have a different immune system and writing a, a, a grant in, you know, a local grant for $50,000 uh, for an innovator award, which was like based on, you know, a new idea from a young investigator, which was funded. And then later on, a grad student came in my lab and took on that project and, you know, uh, took, took that um, uh, idea and grant and started working in that area and really expanded on it and did some fantastic work. And if it wasn't for that uh, support, you know, I couldn't have done that. So I think it was all, it was a combination of things and just being very lucky with good colleagues, supportive environments, and uh, really, really good trainees that, because it's easy to have ideas across so many different fields. Actually yeah. doing it in the lab requires, you know, a managerial and like a operational way of working that yeah. as you probably saw when you were in my lab can appear to an outsider to be on the border of controlled chaos. Yeah, exactly. And, but, you know, it was, it's just sort of dependent on us and you being on the same page about something and we're able to sort of, um, you know, approach an experiment or approach a paper together. Um, and if there's disagreements, we can, you know, be not afraid to tell each other and be, you know, willing to sort of make changes for each other. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I've learned even more about you <laughs> in that conversation before. And yeah, you've had a, you know, quite a journey and fantastic journey. It was really inspiring. Um, you know, so even when I have low points during my PhD, um, sort of think about that, you know, and sort of think about oh, yeah. how you were able to sort of pick it up from, you know, almost. Oh, the low points completely. are the only points that matter. I mean, the low points are the good points, you know, the low points actually yeah. are the high points because it's easy when to, to do well when you're at a high point, right? Uh, it's the low points that, that, you know, define your character and, you know, how you, and we all have them in this business. And uh, yeah, I think uh, everyone has them. Everyone has a different story, but uh, in general, like I think the love of the science gets you through, you know, uh, I think that's what is the most important thing. Like you have to remember why you came into this. And, yeah. you know, I think uh, at the lowest of the low, when you get a cool data and you get a cool result, uh, you know, that is the, the thing that gets you through. I remember being a couple of years into my lab and having a really a point of frustration where I wasn't getting grants, like was training all my grad students. And they weren't doing very well. And I was like having just issues with my lab and everything like that. And I talked to Alberto, my, my old supervisor, and I said, just wait a little bit more until data starts coming in. And he said, once you start getting data, like once your grad students start generating like the first piece of new data in your lab and bring it to your office, that's going to change everything. And sure enough, he was exactly right. Like, yeah. you know, I remember the day that we did one experiment and this gel worked out and we learned something new. And it had to do with how when we incubate this enzyme at a different temperature, which we thought was dead, that fish enzyme, which all we had to do was incubate that at a cool, at cold temperature and the activity mm -hmm. all of a sudden, boom. And lo and behold, we got this bad, you know, huge product from an enzyme that we thought was dead for a couple of years because we've never thought about incubating a fish enzyme at a colder temperature. And when that <laughs> data came in, it, it totally undid that two years of frustration. And it was just that moment of, oh, cool. Okay, this is something we could build a story around. Um, so yeah, so you have to be in this for the love. And then there's, there's always highs and lows in this, in this process. But I think the lows are, um, 
to also so beneficial. Important. And yeah. that's why it's important to have people around you who believe in you and support you. And, um, and also it's important to uh, recognize that the lows are part of the journey. Uh, we're not here to avoid them. We're here to learn from them and um, actually uh, learn to perform better. Yeah. They're the good part. Yeah. I can, say, I can say that to you for sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, of course, incredible. Um, and yeah, that has changed me positively. Um, we're going to go to uh, questions anybody has. I see a few members of your lab here. Uh, and this is your chance to poke at Manny if you want, um, especially David, I see here. Um, but yeah, if anybody has any questions, uh, you can either type it in the chat or just unmute yourself. Um, so whoever wants to ask anything. And if not, we'll just, uh, we could just conclude it from here. I don't think I'm getting out. Wait a second for to see if anyone's typing in the chat, but no pressure from anyone. This is just a more flexible section. I think I've pretty much told the entire I know you gave story. so much detail. I was oh. <laughs> yeah, you left very little openings for uh, exactly questions. Yeah. It has to be a really an off the wall. Oh, Austin, I just had a comment. It was really inspiring. <laughs> Manny's good at that. Manny's yeah. <laughs> What's the comment? No, she says it's really inspiring, and thanks. <laughs> Well, thanks. All right. Awesome. Well, it looks like you gave a really good talk in terms of, you know, everyone seems completely satisfied. So, yeah, we'll just conclude it here. I'm sorry. Um, and I'll just send an apology email to everybody who registered. Um, I'll just post the video to everybody. Um, and so thanks again for coming. Thanks, David. Um, and yeah, to thanks everyone, for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, anytime. And um, to everyone participating and to all the people that registered uh, for this event, I'll send them a video of this um, interview so that they can watch it whenever they want. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks everybody for coming as well. Um, and hope to catch you another time. And I'll probably see you around when you come back to SFU. Good. See yeah. you around, Joko. Okay. Yeah, of course. See you around. Bye. All right. See ya. <laughs>